Hey girls and gals, welcome back to my channel. My name is Taylor and today's video is going to be a weekend reading vlog. Now normally I try and have some kind of theme for my vlogs, whether that be a weekly reading vlog, I kind of have an idea of what books I want to read that week, or if it's a weekend vlog especially, I will have a book that I want to finish and kind of make it more of a book specific reading vlog. I don't actually have any plans at the moment. I'm not going to call it a reading slump, but I'm kind of feeling a little bit weird about my reading. So I'm not really sure what I'm going to pick up this weekend. I am in the middle of Pet Cemetery, so I should probably finish that. That book is so sad for so many reasons. Like it's not even scary to me yet. It's just depressing. Um, so I've been taking my time with that one. So I want to read that and then I'm not too sure. I'm in this stage where I find myself every September where I want to read a bunch of horror books that I've been anticipating all year long that I've been saving for the fall. But I don't want to read them all because I want to save some for October and then I always end up like saving too many for October and then just not getting around to them. So maybe some horror, maybe some fantasy as well, just because I did recently participate in the Summer Ween Readathon, which was an absolute blast. I loved it. However, I cannot stick to a TBR um, for a length of time. It's why I never really do monthly TBRs on this channel. And um, the whole week when I was reading, I was like, okay, I love all these horror books. I'm having a fun time, but I kind of want to slip a fantasy or something in there. I wanted to be true to the readathon, so I just stuck with horror, but I've been feeling fantasy, so we might pick up something like that as well. So yeah, this is this is gonna be my intro clip. Sorry that it's a bit of a rocky journey since I don't know what to prepare you for for this vlog, but I will talk to you guys in the next clip when I've decided a book and have committed to it, at least for the length of this weekend. can't tell by the lighting it is a lot later than when I talked to you guys in the opening clip. However, I have kind of figured out what I want to read. So Pet Cemetery as an audiobook. That's going to be my audiobook for these next couple of days. And then I actually got my book of the month box in the mail. So I think I'm going to read one of those because I was really excited for this month's picks. So probably that. I might do like a 24 hour readathon sort of deal because I'm not tired at all and and it just kind of sounds like fun. I have to work tomorrow, which is not ideal. I've just been having a really bad time sleeping lately, as in like it's not been a fun experience. Um, for like the past week, I have just had really bad anxiety dreams and just have been dreading going to bed because I know my dreams will be bad and then I end up sleeping way more than I normally would because the quality of sleep that I'm getting is not great. So I figure I'm not gonna like push myself to do a 24 hour readathon, but I'm also not gonna push myself to not do a 24 hour readathon. Like if I'm not tired, I'm not gonna push myself to sleep because that just doesn't sound like fun right now. Um, just, just quarantine things. <laughs> I know I cannot be the only one who has this sort of like sleep thing going on um, in terms of quarantine at least because at the very start of March it was I was still on like a semi-normal sleeping schedule and my partner would stay up until like 4 a.m. Um, and then not be able to go to bed until then and I was waking up super early for whatever reason. So like we'd find ourselves on like opposite sleep schedules and then for like two weeks it'd be like that and then it would switch where I wouldn't be able to go to bed until like three, four, five. Um, there was one week where I couldn't get to bed until 6 a.m. every day. That was fun. And like the first month and a half of quarantine was like that for us and it kind of evened out as we got into the new normal and all of that and then once things started like prematurely opening and um things kind of went back to normal 
normal. It's kind of started up again, so our sleeping schedules are a little bit crazy. But this is not a vlog where I discuss all of the side effects of my crippling anxiety. This is a vlog about reading, so I'm gonna talk about my book of the month picks. Listen, book of the month has been killing it. The past two months especially because they have like five options every month and you can get one book and two additional add-ons. So in theory you can get up to three books every single month maxed out. The past two months I've wanted to get more than three um, and last month I was like it's okay I'll just get some add-ons for this month and then this month came and I actually got three of the selections that came out. Two were book of the month selections and then one was an add-on. So the first one that I got that I'm really excited about is called Cast and it's The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. It's a very hefty nonfiction book which is very intimidating and I'm definitely not going to pick this up tonight because this is a book that I don't want to speed through. Um, it's 400 something pages. I've heard that it's a very heavy nonfiction and so this is an eye-opening story of people in history and a re-examination of what lies under the surface of American life today. Isabel Wilkerson gives us a masterful portrait of an unseen phenomenon in America as she explores through an immersive, deeply researched narrative and stories about real people, how America today and throughout its history has been shaped by a hidden caste system, a rigid hierarchy of human rankings. I'm not picking this up for this vlog because I want to dedicate a period of time to this book because I think it's it just is gonna be a tough read um, looking through it. So I do want to pick this up this month. I have been falling behind on my goal of wanting to read one nonfiction book a month. So I think this is gonna be my pick for September. I've been trying to do a whole lot better about reading my book of the month books the month that I get them. So I'm hoping to get to this one sometime in September. Um, the other two though, I might pick up one of them today or tonight rather. So the first book is Winter Counts and the author's name I've tried to look it up and I haven't found an interview with the pronunciation yet but it's by David Heska Wanbley Wyden. But this is a thriller and it's an own voices story about a Native American man who is the local enforcer on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. When justice is denied by the American legal system or the tribal council, Virgil is hired to deliver his own punishment, the kind that's hard to forget. So this is a vigilante story and it's also about Virgil coming to terms with being a Native American in the 21st century and what incredible cost that that has on a person. So this sounds really incredible. So I am looking forward to this one. I might pick it up uh, because it does sound like a very fast paced thriller that I could get through in not a lot of time. And then the last one I have is Piranesi by Susanna Clark, and this one's a lot shorter than I thought. I guess just because it's fantasy and I believe it's standalone, I thought it was going to be a lot longer, but this one is only 245 pages, so I might pick this one up as well because that's definitely a book I could read in one sitting if I wanted to, and I have absolutely no idea what this one is about even though I have read the synopsis multiple times. It just, it sounds like one that I'm just gonna have to read and experience. So there you have it. I am going to try and read a little bit more from my audiobook Pet Cemetery, before picking one of these up, but I was really excited to get these today because that's just perfect timing for a reading vlog. So since I last talked to you guys, I have listened to about an hour more of Pet Cemetery, and I'm really enjoying it, but I'm to the 60% point and I didn't realize like, the main plot point, like there's two main plot points that I feel like everyone knows of. The first one happens fairly early on in the book. The second one hasn't even happened yet and it doesn't really seem like it's going to happen yet anytime soon, which um, I thought was really interesting. It definitely doesn't surprise me because it is King and he likes, you know, drawing things out. One of the things that I like about his books, um, I don't mind a lot of like superfluous content in there. I like a lot of character development, descriptions, all that stuff but it is interesting that I haven't hit that main plot point that I feel like everyone knows about and talks about when they talk about Pet Cemetery hasn't even happened. But I think that I am done listening to that audiobook for a little bit, so I am going to pick up Susanna Clark's Piranesi. That's how the internet told me to pronounce it. Um, so that's how I'm gonna go with. Again, I have no idea what I'm getting into. Something fantastical if 
the um, front cover is any indicator of what's going on here, but I do have that. And then I've also got a little bit of a late night snack. Um, I have, first of all, I found this at Target and it probably doesn't work because these little gimmicky things never work, but they also get me every time. So this is the Juni Functional Water Beverage and this is the Calm Strawberry Basil and Magnesium. So I thought that might be nice. I'm a huge energy drink fiend. I'm trying not to drink them as much, but I just really enjoy the flavor of them. Um, like I don't like coffee as much, so I really like those. But I also don't want to have one late at night, but I am kind of craving something like sweet and um, just something that's a little more exciting than water. So I'm going with this. It's supposed to be calming and it says healthy magnesium helps keep stress in check and promotes better sleep. So we'll try this out, see if it does anything. Probably not the most conducive thing to a 24 hour readathon, but I'm not pushing myself to pull an all nighter. So I thought I would try that. And then I've got some birthday cake bunny grams because I'm five. <laughs> And then I also have some chocolate dessert hummus to dip those in. So that is my game plan and I'm gonna get to reading now. I may have picked the wrong book for this because I have no idea what I'm reading. <laughs> Paranesi may be short in page count, but it is very, very dense. And it just, it feels like a dream. It feels like it's written like a dream where, you know, when you wake up from dreams and there are all of these different details and you're trying to describe them and they make sense in your head, but they don't make sense if you were to write them down on paper that's what this feels like. Like here's how this book starts out. When the moon rose in the third northern hall, I went to the ninth vestibule, entry for the first day of the fifth month in the year the albatross came to the southwestern halls. When the moon rose in the third northern hall, I went to the ninth vestibule to witness the joining of three tides. This is something that happens only once every eight years. Like it just throws you in. I don't know where we are. I don't know anything about the main character because this is kind of like a diary entry. I'm only on page seven, but it's just been like the whole thing has been like that. And this isn't a spoiler, I don't think, because again, it's on page seven, but a list of all the people who have ever lived in what is known of them. Since the world began, it is certain that there have existed 15 people. Possibly there have been more, but I am a scientist and must proceed according to the evidence. Of the 15 people whose existence is verifiable, only myself and the other are now living. This is probably not the best book to start at 1.30 in the morning, but here we are. Yeah, I guess I'll give you an update when I get further into this. So I've been reading for like half an hour I still don't really know what I'm reading, but in a really, really good way. I don't know. I'm really enjoying it. I don't know what I'm reading. I don't know what's happening, but the writing's absolutely beautiful and I'm just enjoying the journey. I think people are going to either really love or really hate this one. Um, if you're like a plot driven reader, I just wouldn't even try because I don't know how much plot we're going to get. It's a lot of beautiful description, but it does still feel like a dream. I don't understand what's happening, um, but I'm here for it. All I have gathered so far is that the main character lives in this other world and there's knowledge that this is a different world than our world. I think, and this world is a house. So this house is pretty much limitless. Um, I think he's been exploring it for years and there's still different hallways and levels to explore. Some of it is like blocked off by water. Um, so it's like surrounded by water and there is only one other person that's living there. And it kind of seems like this person had a life before this world and somehow he was dropped into this world and he doesn't know how or he hasn't told us yet. It's wild. <laughs> it's a wild time, but I mean, I'm really enjoying it so far. So 
sorry for the crazy lighting because I was not expecting it to come on and do a, another like face-to-face -face talking update. It's not about Piranesi, although I am like 70 pages into it and don't know what this book is still, but I am loving it. It's a weird wild ride and it's exactly the kind of just weird off-putting almost all aesthetic, almost all atmosphere and character and aesthetic and ambiance. Um, the plot is kind of there. Um, you don't really understand why they're doing things that they're doing. It's great. Everyone's not gonna like this, but if you want a fun and wild time, that's been a fun and wild time. But I just realized, so Christopher Paolini is coming out with a new book like next week. And I have known about this for a while. Um, I actually had his book in my most anticipated releases of the year, but I did not know that this book is hefty. So it's a space opera, which I knew it was science fiction fantasy, but it's apparently a first contact with aliens space opera, which wow. And it's like 900 pages. Why did no one tell me it was a tome? I am so much more excited now. I love huge books. One of my favorite books is It by Stephen King. That's like 1,200 pages. Prior to the Orange Tree is another one of my favorites. That's like 900 pages. I'm gonna have to race out and get that one now because I just became way more excited for it. I mean, I was already, it was already on my radar, but I just, I really, I really need that. So hopefully this clip made sense because it is 4.30 and um, I'm not tired. I don't think I'm tired, but it's hard to string sentences together also because I've just been reading whatever the heck this is um, because there's very, there's very little dialogue because at this point in time, there are only two people that live in this world, um, the narrator and the other. So yeah. Um, this is probably going to be my last update of the night slash morning since it's technically morning. I am going to be an absolute bear at work tomorrow probably. I have an alarm set for 7. That's gonna be fun. But um, yeah, I will talk to you guys tomorrow morning. now Sunday and I know the last time I talked to was sometime very 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 early Saturday morning. Saturday was a trip so I stayed up until like 6 a.m. had to go to work at 7. I worked until 3, came home. I took a four hour nap and then pretty much had only a couple more hours left of the day before it was over and then I had to be at work at 7 a.m. today. So I do have tomorrow off so I'm hoping to get at least somehow on a regular sleeping schedule and I can't say that I recommend staying up basically all night long and then taking four hour naps in the middle of the day but there it is. Yesterday I actually ended up finishing both Pet Cemetery and Piranesi and then today I actually started and finished Mallory, um, the audiobook of Mallory while I was working because I was doing a floor set, I can listen to my headphones, it was pretty great, I felt very productive. So let's talk about those. First of all, Pet Cemetery. I really enjoyed this one. I'm glad that I finally read it. It wasn't scary in the sense of a traditional horror movie being scary. Um, it's more like scary sad. Um, if you actually think about these things happening to you, it's horrifying to think about, but it's very sad to think about. So spoiler alert for Pet Cemetery, and I will put a little spoiler thing down at the bottom of the screen. It'll be up for the duration of the spoiler. So both a beloved family pet dies in this one, and then also um, their two-year-old son, I believe, one or two-year-old son. And of course, this pet cemetery has the ability to bring things back from the dead if you bury them in a specific place. I think everyone pretty much knows the premise. Um, there have been a couple of adaptations where I feel like even if you haven't read the book, you've probably seen the movie or at least know what happens here. So I was pleasantly surprised to see that for about 70% of this book, it is very slow moving 
and the only death pretty much the death of the family pet happens pretty early on and gets resurrected back from the dead something is off with the cat it's not the same family cat as before it died but it is reanimated but there's something off about it because as the tagline says sometimes dead is better so you really get a sense of impending doom and just kind of seeing this foreshadowing of this event taking place and knowing that it's possible to resurrect things from the dead but something goes wrong and they're definitely not the same as they were before they died the first time. So all that being said, I was very prepared for Lewis's son Gage to die. Um, I think pretty much a lot of people know that going into this, that it is a about a death of a child as well. That did not happen until I believe like 70 or even 80% of the way through this novel. And then there is a long period of time where Lewis is actually debating whether or not to bring Gage back from the dead or not because he's seen with Church that um, they don't come back the same. Gage is probably not gonna come back the same, but he, he wants to try. Um, I think that's a very hard discussion to have as a parent. I don't think that anyone in that situation wouldn't at least feel a slight pull, at least to see their child again one last time, especially if they died in such a sudden way that Gage died. So the contemplation of this is lengthy and it's sad and it's written really, really well. I mean, there are no good choices here in this situation, either you just, you know, your son dies in a tragic accident and that's the most you see of him, this beautiful, vibrant, young child dies and you never see them again, or you know that there's a chance to bring them back. They're probably not going to be the same, but is it still going to be a thing that you're able to love, able to see your son again? Like, is it worth it? And so Lewis really struggles with that. I thought that was written exceptionally well. And then Gage actually doesn't come back until like 90% of the way through the book. And then the climax is very fast paced. And all of that really shocked me. Um, I haven't seen the original in a hot minute. So I don't actually remember too much about the pacing, but I definitely think from at least the remake, which I haven't seen yet, but I do want to watch this October, that the pacing kind of goes a little bit different. And in my mind, I had kind of thought that Gage is, dies a lot earlier in the novel and comes back a lot earlier in the novel. And there's more of like this undead Gage presence throughout the novel. So I actually really enjoyed the way this was done and I thought it was a lot stronger than had it gone a different way because I think just the contemplation and, and all of the moral dilemmas and all of the existential terrors that this family goes through and discussing that and mulling all these things over in your mind is a lot more terrifying than any zombie could ever be. So I really enjoyed that. And that's the end of the spoilers. Um, I thought this was one of King's stronger endings. Just know if you want to pick up Pet Cemetery and you haven't already, you're thinking about picking it up. I think a lot of the terror doesn't come from traditional horror aspects of zombies or things that go bump in the night. It's really just really more sad and then sitting back at the end of the book and contemplating maybe what you would do in that situation or just seeing all these characters have to go through it and live their lives with really terrible things happening, knowing that's a part of life and having to kind of relive that trauma and having that trauma with you. So trigger warnings for child death, pet death, pretty graphic descriptions of violence and death. And then also the R word is used in this novel and I'm not trying to justify that, but it is used in like a doctoral setting. I wasn't alive when this book was published, so I don't know if that was like standard terminology for doctors to use, but it was used in a just matter of fact, a doctor was saying it. It wasn't used as a slur, but that word is a slur. So just be prepared for when you go in there. Um, it can be very jarring, especially if you're listening to an audiobook to just all of a sudden hear that word. So trigger warning for that as well. And I did really enjoy it. I don't know. It's in my top 10 kings for sure. Um, I'll have to really think to see if it gets its place in my top five because I did really enjoy it, but I don't know how much I did, if 
that makes sense. Like it might be at spot six or seven on my list of kings. So there was that. I really enjoyed it. And then the second book that I finished was Piranesi by Susanna Clark. This one is a Bonkersville ride. So it's a mystery in the way where you know nothing about anything until maybe like 85% of the way through the book. So just keep in mind with that. You're just thrown into this very dreamlike world with only two characters for pretty much the entire novel. Um, and the setting is a world that's different from ours, but this world is just a house and picture like very classical Grecian architecture. There are a bunch of different halls and different rooms and there are a bunch of different statues like this one everywhere. So, and there are three levels and that's the entirety of this world. These halls go on forever. Like I mentioned, I had no idea like where I was, who these characters were, what the point of this was, anything about this novel until like 85% of the way through and yet I loved it. So if you know you need a very structured plot and an understanding of the world that you're in, you're not gonna find this in here. I thought it was really enjoyable and it's only about 250 pages. So if you're interested, definitely pick it up. The first chapter is only a page front and back long. So um, read that if you're intrigued, but then if you are so off put, buy it just DN and you don't like it dnf it because it's it's the same same weird dreamlike sort of thing going on like this is if you had a really complex detailed dream and you know dream logic everything makes sense in the dream but then you wake up wait a couple hours and then you try and describe your dream to someone it like won't make sense so that's like kind of what this book is i really enjoyed it that being said i know this is not going to be a book for everyone i have not read um the other book by this author that's pretty popular um jonathan strange and mr norrell from what i've seen from other people's reviews this is nothing like that book the writing style is the same but the feel is completely different so um, if you've read that one and this sounds a little bit different, it is, it's, they're very different pieces of work. So I haven't read the first one. Um, I'm going to now because of this, because I enjoyed it so much. Um, I'm going to pick it up because I'm very intrigued by what else Susanna Clark has to offer, but it is very different. Definitely my experience of pretty much staying up all night to read this one was really fun because like I said, this did feel like a dream and kind of reading it at four or 5 a.m. when you feel like you're the only person on earth and also in lockdown too, um, it really added something to this book. So that was a really enjoyable reading experience as well as a really enjoyable book for me. And then the last book and the one that I actually finished today and started today was Mallory by Josh Mallerman. This is the sequel to Bird Box. When I first found out that this was coming out, I was kind of excited for it. Um, just because I like Josh Mallerman as an author. I didn't really think Bird Box needed a sequel and I was content with the ending, but I was just intrigued to read it just because I like Josh Mallerman's work. Um, I enjoyed this. I didn't not enjoy it. And I thought that the direction this went in was a lot different than anything that I would have expected um, by the end of Bird Box. So Bird Box, you end at one location and Mallory has like a completely different plot um, to what you'd expect after reading Bird Box, what the sequel might be like. So I enjoyed that. I thought it was very creatively done. Excellent writing as always. The characters were really good as well. This is a very character-driven horror. I will say having read Bird Box, I did have several moments in that book that genuinely creeped me out and scared me. This one, I didn't really feel that so much. I don't know whether it was because I've been in the world, so like the concepts aren't as new and as foreign, or just the situations that the characters found themselves in didn't seem as high stakes as Bird Box did to me. And Bird Box, I think I read it in 2018, and that was in my top five books of the year. Um, whatever year I read it in, in 2018 or 2019, it was in my top five books of the year, hands down. It's one of my favorite horrors because it's one of the books that did genuinely scare me. And this one was good. It just never evoked those emotions for me. So it was good writing, but I didn't have an emotional attachment to the way that I did for Bird Box. So 
that being said, I didn't hate it. I know a lot of people are reading this and really not enjoying it. I'd say Bird Box works really well on its own. So if you have a lot of misgivings about Mallory and you think Bird Box should be its own thing, you don't need to read this. And I would just skip it and call it a day. If you're the least bit curious, I would read it. I definitely don't think it's like a waste of time. And it was really cool getting to see characters that I had grown to like so much in Bird Box. Um, it's like about 20 years set in the future for Mallory in some chapters of it. So that was really cool to see some of the characters who were children in the first one now being grown adults trying to navigate this world. So this is a very, very lengthy update. So I'm just going to cut it here. I will say having read all of these good books, I really want to pick up another book because I am just on a reading roll. I was kind of in a reading slump at the beginning of this weekend. And now I'm just really invigorated to pick up more great literature. So I will find another book and then I will We'll check back in with you guys a little bit later today. So it is a very, very late on Monday and I kind of realized that I had never actually signed off for the vlog. So I'm just gonna wrap it up real fast. The only thing that I ended up picking up after I read Mallory by Josh Mallerman was Air Fire. I have the naked book downstairs, but I'm on page 220 something. I am really enjoying this so far. I will say it does start off very, slow and normally that's not like a huge issue for me. I don't mind a slow burn. However, it did kind of feel more along the lines of kind of recapping what had gone on in the last book and the characters kind of emotionally reacting to what had gone on in the last book. So it has started out a little bit slowly and then I just think that some of you're following actually several different characters. There are several different points of view in this one, which is nice, um, kind of seeing more perspectives than just Selena's. But that being said, with any book that does have multiple points of views, I do think it's easy to find one that you're more invested in than the other ones, um, but they're all pretty equal. And honestly, when certain things happen, um, it's switched off being the one that I want to follow the most and are most intrigued to follow the most. There's a new character in introduced in here, Manon, who's really cool. Um, I love a, well, I think right now she's pretty, pretty villainous, but a morally gray, ambiguous character. I love that. So she's pretty great. Um, I'm really enjoying the things that Selena is doing in here as well. I think her character had the slowest start in this book and then seeing Dorian and Kale and everyone back at the castle is um, pretty cool as well. So that is going to be it for this reading update and this long weekend. I managed to read a bunch of different books over the weekend, which is really nice. I feel like I'm out of my weird little reading slump that I was finding myself falling into at the beginning of this weekend, which is always really nice. So that is going to conclude this vlog. If you made it to the end of this video, please leave a comment down below, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe for more content from me, stay safe, stay well, and I am so happy you're here, and I will catch y'all in my next video. Bye!